Hello and welcome back. This is Dawn. So today I have a special one for you. We are going to be watercoloring my newest images with honeybee stamps. Yes, you heard that correct. I have released a stamp set with honeybee stamps. This is eternal love. Now today we're going to be watercoloring the images. So I will not have the process for putting together, especially this shabby sheet card. But if that's something that you would like to see, make sure you like this video and let me know in the comments and I will work on that. So here is a closer look at Eternal Love. Now here I have three sets of florals that I've illustrated. You have Morning Glories, Cabbage Roses, and then Camellias. Camellia Sasenquas to be uh, exact. So you've also got a bunch of beautiful sentiments in here in a gorgeous script font, and then the matching dies here are also available. Now mine are super dirty because I've already given them a good workout. So let's take a look here at the images stamped out in black on Nina cardstock. Here you can see how gorgeously detailed each of these images are. There's just enough detail in these that even if you're not a colorist, you could leave these uncolored and stamped in like a sepia ink or even different color inks and they would still be gorgeous. I'm using Fabriano Artistico extra white hot pressed watercolor paper today. Now this comes on a block and I just use my palette knife to slide down the edges to release each piece of paper. Now I will have lots of different examples using this set. However, today I had to get this one out of my system. When I was illustrating this set, I knew that I would be doing high detail watercolor and I couldn't do anything else until I got it out of my system. So that's again what we're doing today. We're going to watercolor each of the images. Now this is a five by seven panel, so I'm going to take one and I'm gonna trim it at three and three quarters, and then I'm gonna repeat this three times. That's gonna give me three panels of three and a quarter by five inches. Then I'm gonna do my stamping on each of the panels. This is super simple for each one. I'm just gonna stamp the image in the middle-ish. I'm gonna go a little bit closer to the top for each one to account to leave room for the sentiments at the bottom. Now, funny story, this one right here, I made a mistake right out of the gate. I stamped this in the wrong place. So this was supposed to be a trio of clean and simple watercolored cards. Then I made the mistake of incorrect placement when I did my stamping for this image. And I had to completely change direction. But we'll talk about that more later. All right, so I'm gonna use Antique Linen Distress Ink to do my stamping. Again, this is my preferred ink for no-line watercolor. And because we're using this hot press paper, we're going to get a much crisper stamped image. However, if need be, I can stamp this a couple of times to deepen up the color of that ink. Antique Linen is quite light, especially mine. I don't re-ink it often because I would rather build the ink than have it be too dark. So here we go, I've stamped that, I think, three times and uh, my eyesight's not what it used to be you guys but you can see here that we've got all the beautiful detail perfectly stamped image in a very light color I went ahead and did this for all three images and now we're ready to paint so my setup is pretty much the same I'm going to use the Mungyo watercolor palette I've got a paper towel for my brushes today I'm going to be using a number two uh, Princeton Heritage 4050 round and a number five Princeton velvet touch round I like these because they have nice tips there. They come to a nice point. And then the number five has a nice belly and it holds a lot of water. So I'm not constantly having to refill. I'm gonna use the two brush method. I've explained this before. I use one to lay down water, one to lay down pigment. I've got a little bit of rose matter here on the palette that I've watered down. I'm gonna use that number five to pre-wet my petal. And then I'm gonna drop in some of that pigment using the number two brush. When necessary, I'm gonna use that number five to help uh, combine those two areas of pigment just to get them flowing. Sometimes it takes a second just to get them to uh, start moving, but after that, touch it as little as possible. Trust me here, hot press watercolor paper, it's not as popular as your cold press, but you can get so much amazing detail when you use hot press paper. Hot press paper, you generally use a little less water than you do with cold press. Actually, uh, a lot less water. <laughs> you can do techniques with lots of water on hot press, but really the beauty of hot press is capturing detail. And the more water you have, the less control you have. So hot press is perfect for uh, painting stamped images. 
So you'll notice that I'm pretty much taking the same steps for each petal. I am pre-wetting the petal with clear, clean water, and then I'm dropping in pigment with the other brush. I sometimes will then use that, the number five, to connect those pigments, kind of encourage them to move. Other times, if there is plenty of water on the paper and they're moving on their own, I'll leave them be. Now, it is going to be tempting to continue to mess with this, especially for some reason on hot pressed paper. Hot pressed paper almost always looks horrible until it doesn't. As it dries, it's like magic happens. Wet, it looks a little off, but once it dries, it looks beautiful. You'll notice that first petal I had put down. It had a very hard edge. I haven't touched that again yet, you guys. But if you go back and look at how hard that edge was and now how soft it is, it's amazing. You have to just trust it. So I'll wet the petal, drop some pigment. I usually drop the pigment where I want the uh, color to be darkest. So towards the base of the petal and sometimes at the tip of the petal. Depends on the shape I wanna give the petal. Do I want it to look like it's curling back? Then I would put darker pigment at the base, darker pigment at the tip. If I want it to look more like it is concave or bold, I'm going to bring that color further into the center of the petal and leave the tips light. So here you can see this is going pretty quickly and this is only our first layer. I do each one of these in, I think, most of them are in two layers. One of them I end up doing a third layer, but that's okay because watercolor dries back lighter than it goes down. So you are constantly want to reassess where you need to deepen things up. The key is to let areas fully dry before you add another layer. Just like Distress Ink, wet on wet blends, wet on dry builds. So if you want to build that color and intensify it, you're going to have to wait for that area to dry. So again, same steps. You guys have seen me do it on each petal. Pre-wet the petal, drop the pigment, sometimes help it along, other times just let it flow. Anywhere that I feel like I just need a little extra pigment, if the paper is still wet, I can drop that pigment in right away and let it go. If the paper has started to dry, I want to wait until the paper completely dries before I add any more pigment. Now for the centers of these camellias, I'm going to use a little bit of yellow. Now this is yellow orange. I'm going to dot in a little bit of that and then use my number five to kind of move it around. And then I'm going to pick up some brown red and I'm just going to dot that in randomly and let it mix and mingle with that yellow that I just put down. Now I'm putting this in in a very heavy pigment load, so more pigment, less water. But this is going to give me a variation of color in there and I don't have to do anything. So I'm going to continue my way around doing these exact same steps for the rest of these camellias. You'll also take note that I am not going insanely heavy with my uh, color choices or my pigment at this time. I'm keeping everything very, very light. I'm going to reserve adding my darks at a later stage, and this will just keep me from getting too heavy, too dark, too fast. I am a builder. You guys know. <laughs> just call me Bob. <laughs> I like to build my color. So that's that's the uh, route that I take and that's what seems to work the best for me, especially when I'm watercoloring on hot pressed paper. Now these are actually, I illustrated these based off of the camellias, one of the varieties of camellias that I grow. I grow these and then I also grow um, camellia japonicas and I believe they are the morning, morning glows. They're white and they have a soft yellow center and then these are the, I believe it's the Kinjiro. There are Camellia Sasanqua, and I believe the variety is Kinjira. I could be saying that wrong. But they're a beautiful, beautiful, deep, vibrant pink with these striking yellow open centers. So that's the main difference between these and my white ones. These are double petaled, but they have a very open center. And my Japonicas, they are more of they're a bowl flower but they're more round and closed kind of like um kind of like a gardenia but more petals and much fluffier they're absolutely stunning so that was the inspiration for this particular illustration 
I love gardening. I I don't know if most of y'all know, in the last couple of years, I took up gardening and it has been a godsend. (laughs) One for my stress. I needed a new hobby. When you turn your uh, hobby into your job, you have to find a new hobby. Two, I love, love coloring florals and illustrating them. I have instant inspiration all year. Every, like these are blooming right now. So in the winter time, I have my winter blooming flowers and in the spring and the summer and the fall, I have all of those. So I have year round inspiration for my illustrations and for my colors. Uh, I can't tell you how much gardening has actually improved my artwork. It's crazy, but it helps. So if you are someone who loves florals as much as I do and you need a little stress relief, I highly recommend gardening. So back to the project here, you'll notice I'm skipping around right now. That is because generally when you're painting like this, you don't want to paint two colors or you don't want to paint two areas that are touching if they're going to be wet at the same time because they will bleed into each other. I'm not quite as worried about it for this image because they are all the same color petals. But if there, are, if there was like the green leaves next to the pink petals, you wouldn't want to paint them at the same time unless you wanted to get those blends. On this one, I do not want those colors to bleed into each other. But there are some areas where I want to retain my lights. Like um, if I have a petal that's almost white at the edge to show that it's getting a lot of light, I don't want to paint the petal next to it because that color will bleed into it and I'll lose that light color, which is why you see me skipping around now. I'm bouncing around to paint areas that are not next to another wet area. All right, now once those florals are dry, the flowers themselves, I'm gonna move on to the green and for that I'm using a yellow green from my palette here. And I'm gonna do the exact same thing. I'm gonna pre-wet my petal and then I'm gonna drop the pigment. Again, I am not trying to achieve any detail on this layer. I'm trying to get down my base color. Really the only thing I'm concentrating on here is where my shadows and my highlights are going to be. So wherever my shadow is going to be, that's where I'm going to start my pigment. If uh, I need a little extra shadow on the side of this leaf, I will add some extra pigment there. And again, just let the water carry it where it's going to carry it. I can make any corrections, add pigment, all of that good stuff, add extra layers after this first layer dries. So because I go light with my first layer, anything that's, sometimes I magic happens and it's perfect as it is. And then if it just needs a little extra something, something here and there, I can come and uh, add that in on a subsequent layer. So my first layer, I always start out light and I really only concentrate on my shadows and my highlights. So work my way around and hit all of these leaves. So once that's finished, I'm going to move on to the filler flower here, and I'm gonna start by filling in the stem. I'm choosing to fill in the stem because doing no line coloring, once you start to add color, it can become difficult to make sense of what's left because the lines are so light. So I'm I'm choosing to put in the stem and the leaves on these flowers first because I know that once I start filling in those flowers, it's going to be really hard or difficult to see where the stem is supposed to be on here. It, they, I'm going to lose it. So I'm going to go ahead and fill that in first so I know that it's uh, in place and I don't lose it once I start to add in those flowers. Well, I mean, I've already lost it. My mind, that is. But <laughs> that's a totally different subject. <laughs> so map that in and now we're going to fill in the flowers again this is a series of three cards my intentions were going to be a series of three identical cards in terms of layout and we were just going to swap the colors and the floral image Uh, that is not what ended up happening as you could see from the pictures in the beginning we ended up with a pair and then a oddball (laughs) although that oddball showed up to the ball looking like cinderella so we're gonna get to that too (laughs) we're gonna repeat colors this the all of that to say my intentions were to have a cohesive color palette between the three so they would photograph well together so we're gonna use that same yellow for our stalk flower here and um i'm just just like before wet the petal drop the pigment 
And these petals are uh, quite a bit smaller in comparison to the petals we just painted. So it's pretty much just wet the petal, drop a little bit of pigment at the base and at the tip, and let it flow. So very, very simple. Again, not trying to achieve a lot of detail here, just getting that first layer, that base color down. And I'm just going to mention, I am showing you much more of painting this image than I am of the next two images. So um, I wanted to give you a little bit of the flowers, the leaves, and then we will hit the different portions on the other images, something that's a little bit different in comparison to what we've done here. And then we will hit these uh, high points of adding your detail layer. Otherwise, this video would be so long. <laughs> So, so long, but we're, I'm trying to give you guys as much information as possible while still keeping it tolerable and entertaining. Hopefully I'm hitting all those points. All right, now there's one last petal on here we need to finish. Uh, we, we finished that stalk flower. There was a leaf going in front of this petal. So I'm gonna go ahead and finish that off and that will finish the first layer for this image. Next up, we're gonna take a look at how to do the morning glory. All right, so the morning glory is a trumpet shaped flower and this is actually like one large petal. I've already done the first one. I've got the uh, morning glories here illustrated in a couple different positions for you. This one is pretty much straight on. So there's not gonna be a ton of things to worry about as far as your lighting. Your lighting is gonna be pretty flat on this one. So these are trumpet shaped flowers and morning glories come in so many different colors and varieties for this one i've chosen to do your basic kind of blue morning glory a little little hint of purple in there so i've taken some cobalt blue i've mixed in a little bit of purple and this is what i'm going to use for my base layer i'm going to wet sections of this it is just one big petal that wraps all the way around so I'm just gonna wet it section by section. I'm gonna drop the pigment at the end of the petals here at the very edges, and I'm gonna let that water carry that pigment towards the center or the throat of that flower. It's gonna fade out beautifully to almost just white paper. I've also illustrated the six uh, vein lines there in the petal. In some of the morning glories, that is a lighter line of color and in some it's darker. So here I've chosen to make it the darker line of color. So I'll use my number two brush to just kind of fill in that line. And then the rest of the petal, I will do just water and drop the pigment at the edges of the petal. I'm gonna go a little bit heavier here where this one is under that leaf. So I'm gonna drop a little bit more pigment and let that pigment go a little bit further just to indicate some shadow where that that uh, leaf is laying over the flower. And sometimes as this is drying, I'll keep an eye on the rest of the image and see if I need to drop in a little bit more pigment. But again, repetitive, just like before, wet the petal, drop the pigment where I want the pigment to be heaviest. And then if need be, just help move that pigment with my number five damp brush. Now I've referred to this in the past and it is often referred to as a thirsty brush. So you wet it, then you push it or press it onto a paper towel or your rag or whatever to remove all of the excess water and your brush is now just damp or thirsty. When I touch it to the paper, it's not gonna leave a puddle of water. It's just going to move pigment. All right, and I would say these morning glories are probably the easiest of all of the flowers to paint because it is essentially just one large round petal. And like I mentioned before, I'm keeping an eye on the image itself as I'm working my way around, and I'm going to take the opportunity to drop in any extra pigment while the paper is still wet. Once that paper starts to dry, I'm going to stop messing with it, let it completely dry, and then I can uh, add any extra uh, details or any extra layers of color once it's completely dry. And I'll do that same method for the remaining flowers on this particular image. And then for the leaves, I did the exact same technique as I did for the previous one. The only difference is I pushed the leaves a little bluer on this one by adding a little bit of uh, cobalt blue to that green mix there. And then that just pushed them a little bit more bluer for a little variation. All right, so moving on to our cabbage rose here. 
Uh, this one is, uh, I, this one might be my favorite image out of all of them only because I do not have any other cabbage rose stamps in my collection. So I was extremely excited to illustrate this one. Plus the whole theme of the honeybee release this particular uh, month is vintage love. And I thought what says vintage more than a cabbage rose, right? So <laughs> I couldn't wait to watercolor this one. All right, so for this, I'm gonna use that same yellow orange, but I've added a little bit of brown red to this uh, mix here just to warm it up a little bit. So if I would have added orange to it, it would have uh, gotten kind of too vibrant. And again, I still wanted to keep a little bit of that vintage, that nod to vintage. So I added a little brown red to it and that warms it up, knocks it back just a little bit, but still definitely keeps it in that yellow range. All right, so just like before, just like all of the previous uh, things we've painted, I'm gonna use that number five round brush, remove uh, most of the water from it, pre-wet my petal so that I just have a sheen of water on the petal, not a puddle, and then drop in my pigment using that number two brush. Again, this is this two brush method is the perfect way to retain some control when you're watercoloring. So you always have a damp, clean brush on hand to either uh, soak up some of, pig some of the pigment if you put down too much, or to help move some pigment if the paper wasn't quite wet enough. That, uh, that damp brush there actually is, it's perfect. It's like your blender brush. Uh, it's like having your uh, little blender brush there at the ready. And then you have your number two in this case, which is loaded with your pigment, which is ready to just drop pigment should you need to. So I use this method 90% of the time when I am doing a highly detailed watercolor. And really this isn't super highly detailed. This is, um, it's kind of midway in between. I wouldn't call it realism because we're not worrying about getting our colors exactly right. We're not worried about cast shadows in this. We're just getting the basic shape and the basic shadows correct here, leaving some highlights so that we have nice separations between our petals and just adding a variation of color. But we're not getting all hung up on making sure that we have the right tones or the right shades or the right tints. Um, we're just concentrating on the technique of getting the color in the right place. Just using our lights and darks to create a proper form with a little bit of variation in the color. So that's really what you want to, you want to master that first, and then you can worry about getting your tints, your shades, your tones, all of that correct if realism is something that you want to go for. But really controlling that watercolor and getting your your lights versus your darks in the right spots, really that's the key to creating the shape and the form of these flowers. Now I've zoomed in quite a bit here because I wanted to show you how little work I'm actually going to do in the center here. You've got a bunch of little petals illustrated and I am not putting down a ton of color. I'm dropping a little bit of pigment and then I'm using that number five to blend it out ever so slightly. I'm leaving a lot of white space at the edges of these petals. That white space is what's going to separate the petals here in the center. I'm really just adding in what would be the darkest spots here in the center. And sometimes I don't even smooth out those dark spots because those shadows would be super harsh there in the center because everything is so close together. There is no light getting in there to help filter that shadow. So it's not gonna soften it. You're gonna have those harder edges there in the center. All right, I'm gonna continue to paint the rest of this one using the same thing you've been watching for the last 25 minutes. <laughs> And then we're gonna let these dry. Once these are completely dry, we're gonna come in and we're going to add some details because the details are where it's at. And this is completely optional. These actually look very beautiful, just like this with one layer. You could definitely get away with leaving these as is, but we wanna do that little nod to vintage, which is usually a little more detailed. So let's go ahead and take a look at how to achieve that. 
And to do this, we're going to do a very little bit of work to achieve a very big impact. So these little tiny details are really going to bring this image to life. Just like before, we don't want to do too much too fast because we could quickly overwork this. So I'm going to use my number five round brush because it holds more water. I'm going to pick up a very dilute amount of the same color that I used to paint the base of these. And I'm going to create some uh, striations across each petal. This is gonna create almost like a veining pattern in the petals and it's going to help me shape the direction of the petals. So not only does the lights and darks in the petals help to create movement, but these little directional lines will also help to reinforce that. So I can go with the curve of the petal when I'm adding these little striations. I'm being very light, very delicate here. I'm allowing the brush to skip across the paper, I'm not drawing like solid heavy lines. I'm just doing broken strokes back and forth, running vertically with the petal. I'm not gonna do this to every single petal either. I'm just gonna pick places to do it. I'm also going to deepen up any areas that need a little bit of deepening at this point. So if I want to make a petal seem like it's raised or further away from one underneath it, I'm going to add a long shadow. So I'm gonna add a little bit deeper color and then I'm going to use a damp brush to pull that shadow out. So it's a soft shadow, not a hard shadow. If I want to add a, a little bit of separation between two petals and I want them to look close together, then I will add just a line of color between them and that will make them look like they are closer together with a harder shadow. So again here you can see I'm adding those little lines over some of the petals and I'm curving the lines to match the curve of the direction of the petal. Again, very light color here and very light hand. But you can see how this little detail really starts to bring this image to life. This is also a great technique for breaking up solid color. So if you added a little bit too much pigment or you lost your highlights, you can use this technique to kind of break up that solid color. All right, and I'm just gonna continue my way around the image just like before, looking for places where I can help add a little bit of depth, uh, knock some petals back if they're supposed to be behind others, like this little flower right here is supposed to be a little behind and underneath the flower on top of it, so it's gonna need a little bit of deeper color to kind of make it recede. And then I will do the same thing to the leaves. The leaves are pretty much going to be the same technique, except for I like to divide those in half when I'm doing them. So I look at the leaves as two sides. So here I like a left side and a right side. I will work on one side, always going in a uh, diagonal, and then I will work on the other side. This will help me to create a vein down the middle, and it also just helps me to create those smaller, well, hint at those smaller directional veins running through the leaf on each side. And this is the same method that I used for all the leaves for each of these little paintings here. And I could not be happier with how they turned out. Now it's time to turn these into cards. And originally, like I said, these were supposed to be a trio of clean and simple cards, but that one mistake that I made during the initial stamping really messed up the composition on the Morning Glory. And you'll see what I mean here in a second. So we've got our three panels and I pulled out the Lace Heart layering frames here. This is another new one from this release and they've got these beautiful details etched into the edges of each of these layering dies. Now these, were these are gonna create panels or you could create frames from them. But each of these bouquets fits beautifully inside this particular uh, die here. So I'm gonna go ahead and run these through my die cut machine. And while I was at it, I used this larger layer here, this A2 size one, and I die cut that from um, Spellbinder's Alabaster cardstock there. I think it's Barely Peach and their Stormy Sky. Again, I will have all of my supplies listed and linked in the description box below. So if you're looking for anything, make sure to check there. So I thought these colors complemented the colors that we used in our paintings beautifully. And this was the original plan layer these together, add our sentiment, and be done. However, if you'll notice that morning glory, I tried I tried turning it landscape because I originally stamped it too high and to the left. 
So I had all of this open space in the upper right hand corner there and along the right side. But even in landscape there, I still wasn't feeling it. So I walked away, I came back the next day and I thought, well, what if I fill up some of this empty space? This is the vintage love collection after all. So why don't I just play on that and we can create kind of like a vintage stamp or a vintage postcard vibe. I pulled out Postmarked and I thought there's a lot of little great images in here that I can kind of collage together around my watercolor to kind of fill up some of that space. Um, I grabbed a little script here. I thought this would be great. Now this stamp set is designed to go with this little postcard die that they have. It is super cute. Uh, you can catch a glimpse of it in some of the pictures here, uh, the finished projects. I've included a little one off to the side just to kind of, just for some staging. I love those. I love that little postcard and it's so much fun to create these little vintage postcards using this uh, postmarked and that postcard die together. So I picked out what I wanted and we're going to start stamping them. Uh, I don't want to go over my image. At this point, I'm concerned about not going over my image. I I lose that eventually. Don't worry, you guys. <laughs> so I'm, I'm partially inking the stamp up with an ink dauber and a very light application of ground espresso. I wanted that warm, warm brown, but I did not want it to be super dark. I wanted it to look worn and faded. So by using the sponge dauber to apply my ink, I can get a really, really light application. I can just uh, kind of double check where I want to add some darker ink and then I can target it. I can do a targeted application of that ink just to the areas of the stamp that I want using that sponge dauber. So see, now I can get a worn, uneven look uh, to that text back there. And I really, really like this technique. Then I'm going to choose some of the other elements and stamp those out as well. I use the carte postale. I'm going to go ahead and stamp that down the side. I end up using the special delivery and it still was not working for me, you guys. Uh, it I couldn't figure out where to put the sentiment without there being some odd bare spot. So I eventually ended go I eventually ended up going full blown shabby chic vintage something. I, I don't even know what it's called, but I usually don't get down with Brown, but me and Brown, we were having a little party. Um, this took several, several days to finish. Um, not, you know, a full day, <laughs> but you know, a little bit here, a little bit there, and then I would get stuck and I'd have to make a decision. I'd go off and do something else and think about it and then come back and try something new. And sometimes this just happens. This is the real world. You don't always know exactly what you're going to do. Sometimes you just end up there organically. And that's what happened with this card. So unfortunately, I don't have the footage of the entire card. But like I said, if you want to see this card, I, I can recreate it. Now that all the decisions have been made, it'll be easy to recreate it and walk you guys through it step by step. So like this video, let me know in the comments if that's something that you'd like to see. In the meantime, let's go ahead and take a look at the finished cards. All right, so first up we have the camellia. So here you can see all of the beautiful detail that we were able to capture, and this one was just uh, two layers, that base layer and then a few little details. We finished it off super simply with that lace heart layering frame. Absolutely gorgeous detail on these dies. All right, so next up we did the exact same layout, but we just colored this cabbage rose here. I went with the yellows and again, a lot of detail in here with just two layers of color. Kept it very, very simple, but you can see how gorgeous, gorgeous those centers came out with just making sure we painted in those shadows. And again, that largest die here from that lace heart layering frames, so gorgeous. All right, and this one right here, the trouble child. <laughs> I used a lot of product on this one. I figured since I was going all out, I might as well just, you know, go ahead and grab some different things. So here we've got the vintage flora background. I partially stamped that and did some metallic heat embossing. This was the Parissa Wow embossing powder. Absolutely gorgeous. I also um, did some little splatterings of it here on these, uh, what is this, the Lovely Layers Slice and Stump. Layered those in the back and grounded these uh, new Sweetheart Roses layering dies on top of that. I added in a few scrolly sprigs here. These are also in the Lace Heart Frames die. And I cut apart my Sweetheart Roses and used them in a different arrangement. So it comes with an urn that you can create this Sweetheart Rose bush in, but I cut mine apart. 
To ground my sentiment, I used that little postage label there from Lovely Layouts Posted. And I gotta say, um, once I changed my mindset and pushed these morning glories to the background, this really all just started to come together. So it shows the versatility of these images. They don't always have to be the focal point. They can be the support image. So you can use them in the background as well. All right, guys, that's going to finish up the video today. I really hope that you enjoyed it. Hopefully you learned something. If you did, don't forget, give it a thumbs up and subscribe so you don't miss my next video. As always, I want to thank you guys so much for watching, and I will see you in the next video. Bye.